All right, so with that uh, taken care of, let me pass the uh, mic and video on to Kirsten for the last talk of the session. And I'd like us, us all to give a, a huge round of applause to Mark as well as all those people, um, uh, um, both at PCMI and you. Um, so so let's let's un unmute and 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 give a big a clap. personally been having an enormous amount of fun. So I'm going to uh, try not to blow it with the last talk. Um, uh, and let's let's keep the fun. Uh, we were uh, um, uh, discussing uh, an enrichment of degree. And let's go back to this, this topological degree. So we have homotopy classes of pointed maps from the the topological um, end sphere to itself. And this <clears throat> roughly counts the number of pre-images um, and more specifically with a sign. So given a map, its degree is the sum of local degrees and that can be computed at any point in the target. So PN, let's assume that the inverse image is a discrete set of points, Q1 through Q, uh, capital N, and we have that the degree of the map is the sum of uh, the local degrees uh, at the at the inverse image points, and the local degree um, can be uh, computed with the uh, Jacobian degree Q I F uh, can be computed. Uh, we pick local coordinates, let x1, xn be orientational compatible, the local coordinates near qi, let y1 through yn be local coordinates near p, and um, uh, compatible with an orientation chosen on, on S compatible with an orientation. And once we have local coordinates, then um, F is uh, uh, N functions of, of the X and we can form the Jacobian. Um, so we have, uh, Let's call the Jacobian J. And J is the determinant of the partial of F I with respect to um, X J um, uh, over this matrix, and um, the the degree is um, plus one uh, if uh, J at Q I is um, positive. So J so F preserves the orientation and minus one. J Q I is negative, and we ended with with a couple of questions. And the uh, one question is, what if the zeros of F are not multiplicity one? Another way to say that is, what happens um, if J is equal to zero? Um, so there's a, a beautiful uh, answer to this um, uh, given by the Eisenbud uh, Levine. Uh, this one is, is Harold Levine, um, uh, Kim Shashvili uh, signature formula. Um, from the 1970s, the, the late 1970s, maybe around 1980. So it says that um, if we want to know the local degree, we can make a bilinear form and take its, its signature. So this is the signature. Uh, remember, uh, for a bilinear form over R, we, had, uh, we could diagonalize it with plus ones and minus ones on the diagonal. And the signature is the number of plus ones 
minus the number of minus one. So let's define a bilinear form called omega um, eisenbud levine from uh, um, uh over R. Um, and then we'll have that our answer for the local degree is, is um, given by this quadratic form or bilinear form. So where omega EKL um, is the isomorphism class. of the following bilinear form. Um, we'll form uh, the quotient. Um, so we're gonna generalize from the real numbers to an arbitrary field K. So let, let's prepare for doing that. Let's let K denote R and then in a second, we'll just let K be a field. Um, so we're gonna let um, Q be the localization of um, our variables, and let's let's work it. Um, well, this is the local ring at x, so x corresponds to some ideal, and then um, there's a ring ring right there, um, and then over our coordinates of our functions f1 uh, through fn, um, and uh, the fact that x was an isolated zero here. Where did it go? Um, uh, it gives us that this is finite dimensional. So Q is uh, a finite dimensional uh, local complete intersection. And there's a lot of beautiful duality theory, sort of the share duality, coherent duality. Um, and one of the things that this, this theory um, gives is a, is a whole class of, of rings which are self-dual. So um, uh, Gorenstein um, refers to when um, your, your, your dual um, or your uh, uh, dualizing sheaf is locally free. And so, this gives us the, the hom from, uh, from, from Q to, to K or R um, is, is isomorphic to Q. To get a form, um, we need an isomorphism that'll give a form functorially, but we want to distinguish one. So better there's a, a canonical or a distinguished isomorphism um, uh, coming basically from the Jacobian, um, but the Jacobian in, in sort of positive characteristic, let's say from a distinguished, it's called a Sockel and commutative algebra, Sockel element. And um, uh, there are papers by Sheja and Stork giving lovely results on this. And this gives us a bilinear form. We can make this so explicit that you can stick it into a computer. Indeed, Sabrina Pauli has. And how does it go into a computer? It goes like so. So explicitly, we still have our Jacobian um, as our determinant. And now this is, can be viewed as a function in, in our ring. So this is in, in Q. And uh, we can choose any linear map. Let's call it eta Q to K, K linear. Um, such that eta of the Jacobian goes to the dimension. And then the isomorphism class, let's say the characteristic is not two, um, of, of this, the associated, ah, um, I, I didn't quite give you the form. So that, that's, so then omega EKL, Um, from Q cross Q to K. It's a bilinear form on this finite dimensional vector space Q. It's also a ring, um, takes two functions, omega E, K, L of two functions, G, H is eta of the product G times H. And then the isomorphism class doesn't depend 
on our choice of ADA. Um, uh, so um, an example that, that we'll, we'll use in a minute, um, if we had just F in one variable, so A1 to A1 or R1 to R1, and we had F of Z is equal to Z squared, then Q is um, KX and we're at the point zero, um, localized at zero over X squared, which is just KX over X squared. The Jacobian is um, 2x, and we have a basis 1x. We can make a gram matrix associated to the bilinear form EKL, omega EKL, um, and uh, x times x is 0. So gh for g is equal to x, and x equals x is 0. So there's a 0 here. Um, our Jacobian is, is basically x, it's 2x, and it has to get sent to 2. So let's make the characteristic not 2 here as well. Whenever this is divisible by the characteristic, we need to pass to that distinguished Sokol element. And it's, it's a canonical way to write that, thanks to, to Sheja and Stork. It then, we didn't specify what this was. We could choose it to be 0. It doesn't matter um, by, a, by changing a basis. By, um, uh, here. Um, so this is in the generators we had last time, um, which were the rank one forms. This is our hyperbolic element. Um, so uh, Eisenbud asked, um, what about over an arbitrary field? Um, so, uh, he notes that this bilinear form is defined over an arbitrary field K of characteristic not two and acts as a degree. And does this notion of degree have some sort of topological or formological interpretation? And the answer is yes. It was the degree from A1 homotopy theory of about 20 years before, before A1 homotopy theory. Um, uh, so in joint work with Jesse Cass, this, um, this form is identified as the local degree. Um, in GW of K, and um, we proved this <clears throat> for, for Q, a rational point, and then work of um, Razelton and Berkland and McKean and Montaro and um, uh, Morgan Opie and I see at least those two folks right here. Um, uh, uh, consider the case, take care of the case when this is separable. And then with the canonical map from K to the, the residue field is an isomorphism. Um, so the, uh, um, in, in terms of real, local degrees, we have a, um, a quadratic form showing up and A1 homotopy theory also makes a quadratic or bilinear form um, show up. Uh, um, I noticed there was a question in the chat last time about why bilinear forms. I, I have the same question myself, but you know, there, there are some comments. Um, uh, while we're here, let's take um, a detour uh, on A1 um, Milner numbers. Uh, 
and we'll, we want the characteristic of our ground field k to be to be not equal to two. Um, and uh, uh, there, there are a bunch of uh, pretty points of view on Milner numbers. And I like this article of, of Orlick that there's a, it's, it's an old article, but there's, there's a link in the notes. Um, let's start with one, uh, the simplest kind of singularity. So I'm gonna do so simplest singularity. And a singularity is something that looks like this or this or this. Um, uh, is a node, which is something that looks like that. Um, and let's define it. So a node is defined um, uh, over k bar. An algebraically closed field um, to be a point um, P and X with its local ring completed. Um, uh, that looks like a standard node, x1 squared plus x2 squared plus xn squared, and you, you can have higher order terms or you can get rid of them. So in the plane, it looks like, it looks like so. Um, uh, if you start with a more complicated singularity and um, uh, move out a little bit, you're, you're gonna watch that singularity break up into the simplest singularities or the nodes. Let's give ourselves a hypersurface um, singularity um, P in this hypersurface. We'll call the hypersurface X. Um, and if you vary X in a family, um, so uh, let's define xt to be, we start with our polynomial f, but we're gonna add an error term for some fixed a1, a2, a n, x n um, equals t. You can um, make these families more general, but this one has a nice kind of tautological way of looking at it as a degree. Um, so then the potentially more complicated singularity P um, will bifurcate into nodes. Um, and uh, the, the number of nodes is this Milner number. So let's work over, over C at first. Um, the Milner number Um, uh, equals the uh, number of nodes in this family over T um, for, for any sufficiently small A. Or close to, close to zero. Um, uh, and uh, then uh, Milner shows that this is the same as the degree at the singularity of the gradient um, of f. Um, so uh, uh, have an enrichment for this. Um, let, let's see what happens over, over an arbitrary field. Again, the characteristic not two. And then our nodes uh, come in different types. The point can have different fields of definition. So here's our node, P, and it can have a residue field um, that's not the ground field K, field L. Um, and then the tangent directions, they might or might not be defined over L. So the tangent directions determine another quadratic extension Um, and uh, this was 
square, square root of something. Um, for a and l, and uh, it won't matter if we change uh, l by a square. Um, this l happens to be always separable. So SGA 7, 15, because this is always a separable extension. Um, and for example, we can draw the nodes over R. They might be a complex conjugate pair, which is hard to draw. Maybe we'll just draw the real, real nodes over R. And we might have the standard x1 squared plus x2 squared or x squared plus y squared equals zero. And then the tangent directions, we can't draw them. They have kind of slope i and negative i. Um, so they're, they're not there. And this is um, the non-split node. The, rat, the tangent directions are, are not defined over the base field. Rational tangent directions. But if we change this to x1 squared minus x2 squared, then we do get our, our tangent direction. So this is a split node and rational uh, tangent uh, direction. Um, uh, so let's let's make a type of the node that expresses some of this some of this arithmetic. Um, so the type of a node um, P with um, the completed local ring being L X one X N. Uh, is defined to be the local degree of the gradient of, of this, this equation here. Um, uh, and explicitly the type P um, will take the, this transfer, um, which has a nice explicit uh, description with post composition with the um, with the with the trace from Galois theory, two to the n product of the AI in GW of K. Um, so then we can define the A1 Milner number uh, to be the local degree of the gradient again. taken in, in, in Morel's enriched, enriched sense. And this is also um, the sum over the type of P of uh, the nodes in, the, in a generic. So there's an open set of A nodes P in a generic family, um, in a family, in the family above. Um, for generic A. And um, Jesse Cass and I looked at that in the, in the same paper I was mentioning previously and Sabrina Polly uh, with her dynamic interpretation um, uh, looked at it um, uh, as well. Um, uh, so we can do the above example degree we, we above we computed the degree of f of z goes to z squared, and so we can we can take a look at a, a concrete um, uh, example of this particular equality, which is one of many in in Orlick's um, in Orlick's paper, um, some of which are are, are not enriched um, uh, at the moment. So we've got um, a cusp which looks like like this. Let's let our characteristic of k not be two or three. And uh, the singular point is zero, zero in our hypersurface. Um, what is the gradient? We have three x squared and minus two y. So the degree of the gradient, um, this is actually the smash product of the map that sends x to x squared and y to minus two y. 
Um, so we get to take the product of um, x goes to 3x squared and y goes to minus 2y. Um, for similar reasons to the above, this is h and this is minus 2. And one of our relations from last time was that you can multiply h by, by anything. You just get an integral multiple of h. This is h again. Um, uh, and, um, and, and so this, this is our A1 Miller number. We can then watch um, uh, what happens in the family. I'm going to choose a family that looks like something from uh, from algebra. So if we take the family, we had um, x squared minus y, x cubed minus y squared. So we can look at the family where y squared was actually x cubed and you know, plus some x plus some y. But if we do um, this, this is one of our families above. And um, then we have this uh, equation where, we, where when it has a double root, it's a, it's a classical discriminant. So when a equals zero, we'll draw this family. So here's the t plane. And um, at t equals zero, we have our cusp. At other t, we have something smooth. If a is not equal to zero, then um, we have singular fibers. When so this, is, this is a picture of this family over here. And we'll draw the same thing over here, but A is going to be something, some fixed non zero. So it has singular fibers when x cubed plus ax plus t has double roots, which happens if and only if the discriminant equals zero. And um, that's minus 4a cubed minus 27b squared. A cubed minus 27p squared equals zero. So there are two um, um, where this is, this is t here. So there are two values of t where there are, there are nodes. Um, which is the, these, this, the square root of minus four a cubed over 27. Um, uh, um, uh, and we can see, so this is bifurcates the cusp, bifurcates into two nodes. And this was rank two, so that's equal to the rank of of the, the Euler number or the, the, the Milner number, <laughs> Milner number, uh, which is so the, which is the Milner number. So we can see that equality um, between the, lo the local degree of the gradient and, and those two, um, and those two cuffs right there. Um, but now that uh, we've got an equality in GW of K, this also says something about the kinds of nodes that you can have there about their types. So we, we see that it, um, so over the finite field with five elements, then one is equal to minus one. So uh, the cusp can't bifurcate into one split and one non-split node. Um, uh, rational. But uh, over a uh, finite field with um, a three mod four elements, then one um, is not equal to minus one, and we can't bifurcate into two split or two non-split rational nodes. Um, Milner numbers are, are, are used for some, some very cool things. Oops, I don't wanna be here yet. Um, and um, 
one of them is uh, um, when when you, when you have a family of um, of spaces uh, degenerating to a more singular space in the middle, there are formulas for the Euler characteristic of the more smooth um, space and the difference between the Euler characteristic of the more smooth space and the more singular space um, uh, in uh, what's called conductor formulas. So um, a classical Milner number appears in conductor formulas. And it's also um, related to the, um, uh, the Euler characteristic of a, a, a Milner fiber, Euler characteristic chi of Milner fiber. The, uh, the, the Milner fiber, there is a motivic Milner fiber, it's in k naught of varieties of Deneth and Moser. Um, and um, these uh, very, very interesting conductor formulas, um, uh, one could ask about quadratic enrichments. And uh, Mark Levine and Lahaller and Srinivas um, uh, have uh, recent work about quadratic enrichments uh, of such formulas. And they're, they're very subtle. And Ron Azuri has generalized this. Um, so they have um, subtle and lovely results on enrichments in, in, in GW of K. Um, uh, let's let's talk about another appearance of the the EKL form that comes up in a totally different context, and um, I I like the fact that it comes up in this other context as well. So for that, let's talk about the uh, A one uh, Euler characteristic. And it's related to, 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 to this work. Um, so for a smooth uh, projective variety over K, so like a smooth compact manifold over again, our, our field um, K, um, we had this Euler number last time. Let's um, get some more notation for the, the terms we need to, to talk about that. So last time uh, we said that a vector bundle V uh, is relatively oriented and by the data of a line bundle and an isomorphism where L X um, is a line bundle and um, V identifies the square of, of L with um, the, the harm from the determinant of the tangent space, let's say X is smooth, um, and the determinant of, of our bundle. Um, so one, one vector bundle that ha definitely has a relative orientation is the tangent and the cotangent bundles. So um, when we plug in TX for V, um, we get that the harm space is this trivial bundle. So since the home space the TX, the TX is just the trivial line bundle. Um, in algebraic geometry, that's often O for, for the regular functions. So this is a trivial line bundle of rank one. So this is one. Um, and um, so that's um, got a canonical isomorphism to its square and uh, that it's giving us an orientation. So we were um, discussing last time how with an orientation, um, we could define an Euler number 
hey, last time we used a section with isolated zeros, um, but we can take that away and we will this time, that assumption about the, the isolated zero. So it follows that um, we may define an Euler number of the tangent bundle, and that's gonna be the Euler characteristic. So this is our notation for Euler number. Um, and th there are other um, candidates for the Euler characteristic. Um, Frederick de Gliez was um, giving us the dual of smooth projective schemes or coherent objects in his, in his, in his last talk. Um, and um, for folks who, who know how to take a, an abstract dual and, and come up with um, an element of the endomorphisms of the unit. So this was also our, our maps from S naught to S naught. Um, we have a categorical Euler characteristic and that's the same um, as a Mark Levine shows. So this is also um, uh, the categorical Euler characteristic, although we're not going to define it um, right, right now. Um, and there's a reference to uh, uh, Mark's paper aspects of enumerative geometry with quadratic forms uh, in the notes. Um, uh, so with our, uh, with our Euler characteristic definition, let's compute a really fun example that's also due to Mark and um, Lafaller and Srinivas. Um, so uh, they compute the Euler characteristic of a hypersurface. And the, the case of N odd is, is, um, is just a multiple of a hyperbolic uh, plane. So let's restrict it. And even because it's the, the more fun one. Um, and here's our hypersurface. It's cut out by an equation. Um, so for F is um, homogeneous polynomial of some degree. Um, so this means a homogeneous degree E polynomials in these variables. Homogeneous degree E. Um, so uh, define the uh, part of the EKL form, to find B jack to be the restriction of um, the form we were looking at above, Q cross Q, Omega EKL um, to K, um, where Q is now um, the, our, our, the associated function is all of the partials of um, uh, of F. So let's let um, X actually be smooth, and so Q is going to be the form associated to the partials x naught, f, x1, et cetera. Since I just sneakily added the hypothesis that this is smooth, this has an isolated zero at the origin. And so we can run that EKL form. Um, uh, um, so, and we'll restrict that EKL form to uh, some of the degrees, q equals zero to n. Um, uh, capital Q sub little q, these are the degree little q plus one times uh, e minus n minus two. And then um, they show that the A1 Euler characteristic is this fun element of GW of k. It is e plus minus e b jack plus n over two h. In other words, modulo some, some hokey pokey, um, the, this Euler characteristic is being given by that EKL form of um, the zero given by the partials of its, of its defining equation. Uh, here again, H is our hyperbolic element. Um, uh, so um, you can plug this into a computer and get something out. Um, Kirsten? Yes. Sorry, that's, that's, in, that's in my paper with Raxit. That's the Sorry. that's the thing with Raxit. Thank you. Um, 
um, uh, um, so let's 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 get something fun out. Um, uh, so the Klepsch cubic surface is this picture that's been hanging around here in my notes. Um, there it is. It's beautiful. <laughs> this is due to um, there's a there's a picture credit in the notes. Um, I didn't take this photo. Um, so this is uh, the Klepsch x0, x1, x2, x3, such that the sum xi cubed is the sum of the xi cubed in, in P3, in the Klepsch cubic surface. Cubic surfaces over an algebraic closure are um, blow up P2 at six points. So it's classical. Euler characteristic is, is nine. And um, uh, it's a one Euler characteristic. You stick this into the computer and you get out two H plus minus 10 plus minus six plus minus 21 plus minus 14 plus minus two. And um, I did not do this by hand. Um, I computed it last night with Macaulay too. We can see that at five, that there's some nice residues at five. There's, there's something interesting going on. Um, and plus, it's so pretty. Do you, see, do you see the residue? Do you see the five and the, does this thing degenerate at five for some reason? Going so on? away from characteristic five, like this is, there's another form of it. In characteristic five, this thing is bad. And there's another form oh, of the cleft bad. surface okay. that uses that, um, that, um, that there's another equation that would be good at characteristic five. So we should, you know what we should actually plug that into the computer too and see what comes up. Um, uh, okay. So I wanna add another page now beyond this. Up here. Um, all right, our second question that we had um, ended with last time was um, let's um, make an Euler class that will give us more control over this Euler number. Um, in particular, we had an application for the Euler number being independent of the section we computed it with. Um, and it, it's better to have machinery um, to, to, to deal with, with these classes. So that machinery, um, uh, needs cohomology, and we have our stable homotopy category, or stable whole A1 homotopy theory. And um, this produces a lot of cohomology theories on smooth schemes. Um, so everything's homotopy invariant here. Theories, um, H, um, smooth K schemes, uh, X. And um, some examples uh, to keep in mind are um, the motivic cohomology that we've been discussing, our extended cohomo uh, ex um, motivic cohomology that, that's also come up and that we'll, we'll, we'll say a little more about in just a second, um, K theory, Um, Hermitian K theory. And with a cohomology theory, um, uh, let's, um, let's get um, cohomology groups. So uh, one of the, um, uh, what, one of the revelations for me as a, as a younger mathematician um, was getting to define cohomology groups with spectra. So as an advertisement for stable homotopy theory, um, even if you're, you're just learning it, um, one of the ways to describe even singular cohomology, once you have your stable homotopy category, it doesn't need, need to be um, A1, um, but uh, we get that um, homology, even singular homology, has um, this formula as um, uh, uh, pi minus n, of uh, hom um, from, from uh, x to h, which the pi minus n, pi n is like homs from s to the n, 
pi minus n, we get to put the n on the other side. Um, and uh, this n corresponds to some sort of shift, and it's very useful to allow a twisted shift. This is, let's say, the stable homotopy category. Um, uh, let's twist our, our shifts. Yes, twist our shifts um, by vector bundles. So let's let be a, a vector bundle. Um, and then um, we'll say that the degree v part, like n will be like the rank of v, is now the homotopy classes of maps from x to the tom space of v uh, smash, smash, smash h. And we're thinking of the tom space of v um, as a twisted shift. So um, if this, this came up in Frederick de Gleese's talk, we could take v over v minus the zero section for um, um, for, for reasons about taking Tom spaces in K theory, let's put a, a, a dual dual there. This is also a projectivization. Uh, if you take a trivial bundle and uh, then crush the things way at infinity. Um, and this is like a suspension. It would be if this was a trivial bundle, um, but this is a twisted shift of the space X or a twisted suspension of X. Um, in the case of trivial bundles, this gets us back to what we had before. Um, one notation for the trivial bundle of rank n. So here we go. Trivial rank n bundle uh, on, on x. Um, uh, then the Tom space um, uh, be becomes just the suspension. And um, we have what we started with. Um, let's just, and then we don't have to write. So then HV equals HN and then a, the notation above. Um, so in our examples, um, we, we get to see the connection with, with Chow groups that um, we were discussing in Matthew Morrow's uh, talk. Or, so HZ uh, N of X, um, this is the, the motivic cohomology H2N X Z N. Um, and some, some other indexing would make this H2N N X. Uh, uh, and this is the Chow group of codimension and cycles. The formal sums of codimension n um, uh, irreducible subvarieties, so uh, Chow group of codimension n um, cycles modulo um, rational equivalence. We had a lot more um, motivic. Um, uh, yes, good, yes. Can we access other gradients? These are the geometric gradients. And for this talk, we will not access the other, the other gradients. Um, but we could with a spectrum with different suspensions. Um, uh, so um, the next on our list was an extended motivic cohomology. And then the coefficients of these subvarieties are um, uh, elements of the growth indie bit group. So here's um, uh, the Chow bit group. Also called the oriented Chow groups. And with the Gersten resolution um, from Frederick de Gleese's talks, we're going to express these as formal sums of codimension and subvarieties, Z, um, whose coefficients are in the growth and bit group of the rational functions on Z, 
and then they have to vanish under a differential and modulo the image of another one subject to conditions uh, modulo equivalence. And their references in the notes to Barge Morell's um, original article and to uh, a recent book about Milner Witt motives um, by Bachman, Kalmas, De Glees, uh, Fazel, um, Ostfire. Um, we had two more um, uh, examples to keep in mind, and we've already been discussing K theory, um, but let's let's just look at K naught, and this is the group uh, completion. Um, of vector bundles uh, on X, and then we have KO permission K theory, um, group completion of vector bundles with a symmetric non degenerate form. with a symmetric um, non-degenerate um, bilinear form. Um, uh, so um, these these theories are representable because they're expressed as this HOM um, uh, from X to this the theory in this stable homotopy category. Um, uh, and for such theories, we can also have homology with supports. So we'll take um, a closed subscheme of X. And um, the cohomology with support in Z, um, set of homotopy classes of maps from X. So let's put the support here. We have a twist here of X. And it's homotopy classes of maps, which are trivial off of Z. If you quotient by the complement, and um, take maps out of this, then the map is sort of trivial away from Z. So we have um, cohomology, the cohomology theories, and um, uh, we'll have an Euler class for these cohomology theories. So H uh, cohomology theory, and um, we'll, we'll make H a ring, um, and then for our vector bundle with a section, but the section could be the zero section. Um, with um, a section, for example, the zero section, um, the Euler class is um, the, uh, the, the cohomology in degree of V dual supported at F equals zero um, of X and with respect to H2. Uh, yeah, here's the H and here's the H. Um, so is the class of the map um, where we take F and this gives a map um, to V over uh, V minus its zero section. And we can use the map from, uh, from S to H to smash with H. Um, in fact, everything that's not in the zeros of F is sent to the base point. So this has support as claimed. And is our element here, our Euler class. Um, uh, our Euler number, which was the sum of a bunch of uh, local indices. Uh, so the um, Euler 
uh, number, um, uh, we're going to want a push forward. And to have a push forward, we need some assumptions uh, uh, on our on our maps. Um, uh, let's let's put some some in. So um, uh, these assumptions um, are so that um, the the uh, duality theory has something to do with the with the tangent space or cotangent space. Um, so. Um, uh, a, a function is a local complete intersection morphism. Uh, if it locally factors, um, as a closed immersion followed by something smooth, and the closed immersion has to have a nice Kazool complex. So if it locally factors as uh, map P, which is smooth, and um, a closed immersion, Um, determined by a Kazool regular sequence. So a regular sequence is when, when you mod out by the first I and then mod out by that last one, um, uh, uh, it's not a zero divisor. Um, and uh, if uh, the Kazool is the, the higher um, cohomology of the Kazool complex is, is zero. Um, uh, and the properties we want is that it has a well-behaved uh, cotangent complex, which is a generalization of the cotangent space. So this has a well-behaved cotangent, what's called a cotangent complex. And um, the, the few facts that are, are needed here about the cotangent complex is that for the closed immersion, it's the normal bundle, or really it's dual. And for something smooth, it's the, the dual of the relative tangent, tangent bundle. So um, we'll call the cotangent complex of F, call it LF. And for one of these regular um, uh, embeddings, uh, the cotangent complex is the normal bundle of the, this, this closed subscheme here of, of this. And it's really the dual, like cotangent instead of tangent and conormal instead of normal uh, in degree one. So um, the dual of the normal bundle. And um, for something smooth, it's the relative tangent spaces dual or the Kähler differentials omega. P over S, so the, um, the fiber-wise tangent um, dual, and then the composition uh, cotangent bundle is determined by these two, um, I star LP to L, um, PI to L um, to LI. Um, uh, and so we have some relation between Sarah duality and the cotangent space for for these kinds of for the, these kinds of maps, um, and we also have a push forward um, uh, uh, for these kinds of maps. So let's let um, p x to s be a proper. Um, so the inverse image of compact is compact. LCI that. Uh, definition above. Um, and we have a map the other way um, in stable homotopy. So um, this um, it's called the, the Becker Gottlieb transfer. Um, Mark has a version that then sort of push forwards are also sort of part of a general theory by lots of the wonderful um, work uh, Frederick de Gleis was, was telling us about. So it, it, I mean, there are lots of points of view about what's happening here. Let me draw you a cartoon. But in general, if you have um, a map um, X to S in the stable homotopy category, you can turn it around and get a backwards map from S to X, but no, it's not quite to, to X, it's to a shifted twist. So it's to the, the Tom spectrum of LP. So a cartoon for this is, um, so here, uh, um, uh, X to S. This isn't the dimensions I'd, I'd really like, 
Um, uh, but if you embed X into a bundle over S, trivial. over F. And I mean, to get push forwards, we should follow um, Frederick de Gleese's description from, from yesterday, but um, to, to give a picture um, and to see where the cotangent space comes in, you know, we embed this kind of up here and then we do a collapse map, like some sort of neighborhood and the Tom space of this neighborhood, uh, if you should do a fiber wise collapse, trivial bundle over S, so we get the Tom space of the trivial bundle um, over S, and we can collapse um, the square over the, this region. And we'll do fiber-wise. And this is the suspension of S. And um, this Tom space uh, is, um, uh, is, is a twisted shift of X along something like this normal fiber-wise normal bundle. Um, so it's a cartoon um, uh, uh, from, say, uh, stable homotopy theory. And um, once we have a map, the other direction, um, we, we get maps on, on cohomology theories too. And then um, I'm feeling a little guilty for this cartoon. Uh, we, we should really do these with the six functors formalism that we, we saw um, last time and Ayub's purity and Vavadsky's um, work. Uh, so so this, was, this was sort of unfair. Um, <laughs> It's fine. Nice cartoon. All right. Thank, thanks for the for the for the indulgence. Okay. So we have we have a transfer, and it should look like something to do with the cotangent complex. Um, uh, with this with this this transfer, um, uh, if our theory is oriented, we're going to be able to push forward our Euler class to get an Euler number. And the kinds of orientations we're going to be interested in are kinds where we could potentially sort of untwist untwist here. And what is an orientation on a theory? It allows us to take a twisted cohomology group and untwist it. Um, so that's so oriented cohomology theories. Um, so uh, H is GL oriented. Um, if uh, the twisted cohomology groups are untwisted, uh, the, the, yeah. Um, for and their uh, canonical maps, um, giving these isomorphisms, and uh, for example, motivic cohomology and K theory, but not extended motivic cohomology and permission K theory. Um, so that's too bad. It means it's harder to push forward, um, but. Um, H is SL oriented. If there are canonical isomorphisms between the um, between two different twists, when both their rank <coughs> and their determinant, as in the determinant is one, um, so their canonical isomorphisms uh, between the V and V prime degree twisted cohomologies. Um, uh, uh, if the rank of V equals the rank of V prime and the determinant of V is the determinant uh, of V prime. Um, uh, and there's an isomorphism here. Um, uh, so it turns out that this, these are the same theories in a canonical way. So an SL orientation on our theory gives us something called an SLC orientation 
which allows us to make the isomorphism between the determinants be only an isomorphism up to squares. So for L um, X a line bundle. And um, I wanna um, give a hats off to some beautiful papers of Anna Nievsky on SLC oriented um, cohomology theories. Uh, um, and for, uh, for this uh, weaker notion here, um, we get the um, extended motivic cohomology and KO are in fact SLC oriented. Remember our definition of a relative orientation? It was cooked up to be able to push forward. Um, so this was the, um, uh, the hom from the, the tangent space, the determinant of the tangent space, which is like our determinant of um, the, L, the LP here. Uh, so um, let's, let's give ourselves a relatively oriented vector bundle, dx relatively, relatively oriented um, vector bundle uh, on x, p, k, p, smooth, proper, um, h, an SLC oriented uh, cohomology theory. Uh, then uh, we have the um, the uh, the cohomology in degree V dual is isomorphic to the cohomology um, in the in the tangent um, space, and also for something smooth, this LF that we had before um, uh, is is that. Um, so um, let F be any um, section of V, uh, for example the zero section, um, then we have inside H V dual of X with support in F, we had defined above the Euler class of V F. Um, and uh, we can, we have a forget support map to the um, degree V dual cohomology of X with no supports. Um, so any two sections, F1, F2 of V, um, they don't have to have isolated zeros or anything. So they, they're just living in that, in that vector space of all sections. So they're connected by families. Um, of, of A1s, they're, they're in a vector space. So by, by straight lines in this vector space, H naught of V. Um, so that implies that um, uh, the, 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 when we forget the support of E, H, V, F, in fact, what is the forget support map? It's the class of a map that goes from x to x over x minus f equals zero to the Tom space of V. Um, and uh, this was just, you know, f plus smashing with, with s, um, but more or less it's f. Um, and since these are homotopic, we have that when we forget support, um, it's immediate that, um, the image, the image after we forget the support is equal. Um, so we can call this, we can just define this common class to be um, E H V here. So what we've got so far is that under iota, we are now independent of, of section. Um, and then we did work so that this was, um, H L P um, X. So we have P star um, to H naught of um, S 
And what is the Euler number? It is the image under P star of this. So in definition, um, the Euler number um, and HV of V and H naught of S um, is the push forward of E H V. Here we go. Um, so then uh, we had uh, a sum of um, of uh, uh, local indices um, last time for, for doing counting. So this agrees with the NVF, which was a sum over X and X, where the section was zero of a local degree. Um, and um, the, our local degree was in GW of, of K. Um, so where we, we define this local degree with, a, with some comments here. Um, so for H equals HC twiddle KO over um, S equals, um, equals spec K. Um, so, and in particular, our, our second question, which was why is this independent of the choice of section is now, is now for free. So uh, this agrees with that. Um, uh, and this gives, so we now have that NVF is independent of the choice of section. And some references are Deglesian Khan's paper um, uh, that we talked about last time and some joint work with Tom Bachman. Um, and we've, I think we've, we've paid back the, the IOUs from, um, from Wednesday. Uh, so uh, let's, let's use this um, as promised to, to give um, an arithmetic count uh, of the lines on a smooth cubic surface. And this is um, joint with Jesse Cass. Um, so as mentioned before, a cubic surface um, is, so X in P3, X equals F equals zero, where this is in the homogeneous, well, we'll call them W, X, Y, Z of degree three. It's the zero locus of a, of a homogeneous degree three uh, equation. And there's this beautiful um, classical theorem of Salman and Cayley from 1849 that says um, any smooth cubic surface over C um, has exactly 27 lines on it. Um, here's, here's an example. I wish I'd left myself a little bit more time because there's a lot of fun geometry here, um, but I didn't. Uh, I hope I have time to do this. So uh, let's look at the Fermat cubic surface. It's a little less beautiful than the Klepsch, but so it goes. Um, this is f of x, y, z, w is the sum of x, i, of x, i cubed. Um, so we've got uh, three real lines and the real lines we could, so in homogeneous coordinates on P3, we could take any st and P1 and just do um, S minus S, T minus T, it'll cancel out and that's some of the cubes. Um, and this is a straight line here in P1, C, and this is indeed in X. Um, we can do the same trick, but with other roots of unity, um, but they won't be real lines this time. So we have um, S lambda S, T omega T for um, ST and P1C. 
um, we can permute these, um, the variables. We, we get to choose which ones are S's and which ones are T's. Um, so the three ways. Um, and this gives a total of three permutations, three omegas, three lambdas, three times three times three equals 27 uh, lines. Um, so there we go for the, for the Fermat cubic surface, Selman and Cayley's theorem is, is true. Um, we'll do the proof in general. Um, and uh, let's uh, view the lines on the cubic surface as the zeros of a section of a vector bundle. So the space of all lines will denote GR13. So um, keeping with our earlier notation, this is the Grassmannian of um, uh, vector subspaces of C4 dimension of W equals two or equivalently the lines in P3. P1s, the projectivization of W in P3, the projectivization of C4. Um, and we have uh, the, the tautological bundle. And to remind you what that is, it's not the canonical bundle. Um, it's um, fiber over a line, projectivization of W is, is W. Um, the if we want to see what ones are in the surface, we need to know when a cubic polyno polynomial vanishes. So we can make sim three of a vector bundle, just like a vector space. It's, um, it's fiber over a point is then sim three of the vector space over the point. Let's take sim three V dual. This is cubic polynomials on W. And we have one that we're very interested in whether or not it vanishes. So F, the equation determining our cubic surface, determines um, a section, sigma F of sim three of S dual, sigma F at this line, projectivization of W, is the cubic polynomial restricted to W. And, and then um, sigma f has a zero, if and only if that polynomial is zero, which is if and only if that line is in the surface. So sigma f equals zero, if and only if the line um, pw is an x. And um, we've now reduced to counting the zeros of the section. And so we have our Euler number and it's the sum over the lines L and X, because it's the zeros of the section of a local degree at L, we were denoting L P of W before, of, um, of sigma of F. Um, and uh, uh, for a general, um, hypersurface or even complete intersection, um, the zero locus of a section is always smoothed by a result of the bar of L. And in fact, for cubic surfaces, there's so many wonderful things known about them is that, so for a smooth cubic surface, that's a generic cubic surface in particular, but we even know sort of the geometry. Um, there are no mul higher multiplicity roots. So for a smooth cubic surface, um, all zeros, of sigma f of multiplicity one. Since it's over C, um, if we were using the degree in singular homology, the degree from differential topology, we would get, it follows, it, it, um, the orientation is preserved. So we have that this is just one for all of these in our, in our classical context. So we get that the number of lines is the Euler number of sim three of V dual. We, we started calling this V for our vector one. Um, and then we can compute that N of V is equal 27 
by knowing things about the homology of Grassmannians or even with the Fermat example that we just, we just did. Um, uh, um, uh, because this Euler number is independent of the section. So we can compute this with the example that, that we chose. Um, so that's what happens over C. And um, cubic surfaces over R, there's, there's also a lovely story. So um, there's been a lot of work on this, um, but some notable work um, is, is 19th century work due to Schleffli. And um, there can be <coughs> Three, seven, fifteen, um, or twenty-seven uh, lines, and uh, Segre separated these into what he called hyperbolic and elliptic lines. And um, there are um, uh, hyperbolic and elliptic elements of PGL two. And the, the, the words are compatible. Let's let's do the geometry of, of, of real lines. It's, it's fun. Um, so if you take L and X, a real line. Um, uh, um, I recalled the definition of hyperbolic and elliptic elements of PGL2. And we I think we're gonna have to skip that. Um, so uh, but um, uh, L gives an involution of the line, which in particular is in PGL2. Um, uh, uh, an involution L to L. So um, it, there, it turns out there are exactly two points. Oh, here, I'll just define it. So um, uh, um, I of P is the one other point that has the same tangent space to X at that other point. Um, so I of P is defined um, if we take the tangent space, the cubic surface uh, at P, there it is, it's a plane. It contains the line because it's the tangent space and the line is in the surface. Um, so uh, the tangent space intersect with the cubic surface X has to have the line and then has to have something else of degree two. So it's got the line in it. And it's got C for C degree two, because the total degree has to be three. And um, uh, uh, P, um, uh, the, uh, the points of intersection of C with L, um, it's two points. And the other one is where this is sent to on the involution. This is precisely the one other point whose tangent space, so i.e. tangent space of P at X is the tangent space of Q at X and the involution is switching them. So we swap the two points that have the same, the same tangent space. Um, and then um, this involution uh, has some fixed points. The fixed points of this involution, they might be a C conjugate pair, um, uh, in which case um, the line is elliptic. So it's an involution that has two fixed points. So the and um, those two fixed points, they're either both over R or, or a complex conjug conjugate pair. So elliptic, it's just called, uh, the line is then called elliptic. And if they're, if the fixed points of I um, are two real points, we say the line is hyperbolic. I can say this better. We say elliptic, and here we say L is hyperbolic. 
Um, I cannot resist, even though I don't have time for doing this, to tell you what's going on here. So um, we're interested in the tangent space to your cubic surface. You have a cubic surface in a room, you put your index finger along the line and you let your palm follow the tangent space. So there it goes, it's following like this. If you spin all the way around, you are elliptic. If you wobble, but don't spin all the way around, you are hyperbolic. And so you can check um, what they are for the Fermat. I left a, um, a picture in the notes, just um, that, that sort of the, the picture's explanation is that you have these three real lines on the Fermat and every place in the picture where there's a plus, um, I can draw it. So here's the Fermat. We have three real lines, Fermat, like so. They're all in a plane. And here's someplace above the plane where the cubic surface is. And here's below. Now, if you follow your hand, you first along, say this line, you're first like this, with it like this, then we go this, this, these are all, the real lines are hyperbolic. Um, it's a, um, a literal exercise because you are literally moving and I love this joke. Um, okay, so uh, the theorem is that once we separate these, I'm gonna take just, just two minutes, so, so sorry about this. Um, the, so segre, um, it can be time. deduced. I took, I took time in the beginning, so go for it. Thank you. Um, uh, segre could have, could have noticed this. He has enough tables, but it's not clear that he did. And then there's some lovely papers by Akonik, Telemann that are, that are really quite recent and Finesh and Karlamov. Um, uh, and from the spin pin point of view, this is um, a, a, in a paper of Benedetti Sohol. Um, and you can um, get it from uh, um, Horov and Solomon's open Gromov Witten invariant. Um, point of view. Um, and for any smooth, real cubic surface, the number of hyperbolic lines minus uh, the number of elliptic lines uh, is, equal, is equal to three. And the question that we're now all set up to answer is what about other fields? So what about K equals FP, QP, Q, etc. cetera. Um, and our answer is that the above proof still works in A1 homotopy theory. So <clears throat> the above proof goes through. And here's what we get. Um, let's give ourselves a line. L in uh, X, a cubic surface, smooth. Um, inside P3. And uh, we were interested in how the tangent space spins around the line in this involution. Um, let's look at the fixed points of that involution again and make a type. So the type of L, it's gonna be um, an element of the growth and bit group of the field of definition of the line, um, uh, where, so D is in KL star over KL star squared so that we can put it in brackets with, with our generators. Um, so is such that the fixed points of our involution, those two points where the tangent space pauses for a second as it spins around the line, the fixed points of the involution of I uh, are a conjugate pair of points um, defined um, over KL adjoint square root of D. Um, and uh, there's some other ways to, to say this um, in the notes. Um, and uh, um, uh, the, it turns out that the field of definition of all these KL are separable. So our favorite way of writing the transfer as post-composing with the sum of the Galois conjugates will give a transfer on GW of KL to GW of K. And here's our theorem. So let K be a field 
um, of characteristic um, uh, not two, let X be a smooth um, cubic surface in P3, then the sum of all of these types of the lines, so we're going to weight them, the sum over the lines of a weighting that's associated to the field of definition. We take this transfer on GW using the field of definition. And then um, this type, which records the pause points of the tangent space spinning around the line. This always has to be um, uh, 15, 1 plus 12 minus 1 in GW of K. Um, so uh, in the notes, you can see the comparison to C over R, some fun counts, making a kind of an even or odd statement for a, a finite field. Um, and uh, the fact that for quintic threefolds, there's a very uh, beautiful um, type due to um, so Sabrina Pauli, um, and also with some earlier work over R um, by Fineshin and Karlamov. Um, uh, so that there's uh, a lot of uh, great, great geometry to say here. I, I'm, I am over time though. So I, I, will, I will leave it at that. Um, thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Kirsten. Are there any questions? Uh, maybe yeah. I can ask. Uh, uh, as you, you, you see the hyperbolic and elliptic um, this line is really do something with its um, um, normal bundle. So I want to know uh, if they related to define a cycle in the true weight group because to define a cycle in true weight group it's um, kind of uh, needs some condition with different uh, the cycle at uh, there are no bundle at their intersection. So do you have some kinds of results? Can you say that again? I, I'm, not, I'm not following yet. Normal bundles I mean, cool for deformation. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, you, you know the chow weight group, right? And I mean, to define a, a cycle in a chow weight group, uh, you need some condition, I mean, of deep, different uh, nine or different piece, uh, when their intersection, we need some condition of of their normal bundle. Do you mean in the product so, structure on? Yeah, yeah, you mean yeah. In the product structure on Chow. Yeah, Chow? I mean, so so can you can you I mean by this result, can you give some cycle in the Chow group? I mean, some long trivial. Oh, it's a, so um the uh th there's a there's an Euler an Euler class which would put the little local indices. Uh, attached to the particular lines on the cubic surface on the Grassmannian, but maybe that's not what you're asking for. So that, that would be the Euler class with, um, for, with respect to a particular section for a cubic surface. You get a bunch of little points for your lines and their um, coefficients would be the, the local index. And then that's on this Grassmannian. And then I don't know about um, classes in Chow Vit of the cubic surface as a way to get the the local index, um, like another interpretation of the type in terms of Chow Vit of the cubic surface. Okay, I'm not sure, but thank you. Yeah. Some other question? Thank you. Thank you. Any other yes. questions? Yes, yes. Um, so I have one question and one comment. And um, so maybe first a question. So you were, when you were talking about A1 Milner numbers, you also, you also mentioned these uh, motivic Milner fibers, right? They, which live in K0. And there's also this, uh, this motivic monotony conjecture about these motivic Milner fibers. Is this also somehow relatable to your A1 degrees or? Um, would you tell me what the motivic monodromy so, is? So well, in, in very vague okay. terms, it says that um, poles of certain motivic zeta functions correspond to eigenvalues of the monodromy action on some point of the motivic Milner fiber. 
cool. Um, I don't know. Mark might have some good comments about that. Maybe, maybe I might. <laughs> <laughs> Unclear. I know I looked at that a little bit, and um, there's monodrama that comes from a, you have a finite group acting, so roots of unity acting, I guess, right? Yes. This yes, yes. These classes uh, in this uh, sort of refined uh Knot var where you have this um the, you know limit of the roots of unity acting and my impression is that if you take the quadratic refinement all the stuff that corresponds to roots of unity besides plus and minus one becomes hyperbolic because they get paired with each other you have zeta and zeta inverse and this reason that you have this kind of duality pairing between them makes things automatically hyperbolic. That's a guess. But the interesting, you get an interesting um, quadratic invariant corresponding to the plus and minus one in that story. That's, that's my feeling. But I don't know what that has to do with the conjecture. I think it's, I'm not sure if there's a quadratic analog of the conjecture. Mm. Yes, thanks, nevertheless. And yes, so I was wondering regarding your proof of uh, 27 lines on a smooth cubic uh, surface. So it looked very similar to me. Um, so, so it reminded me very much of a also somehow motivic in this k naught of variety sense proof of, I think, Galkin and Schinder, like 215 or something. So what they do is they use the etal Euler characteristic and compute the etal Euler characteristic of the Fano variety of lines, right? Which also somehow very much corresponds to like the, the this third symmetric power you were using in the Grassmannian. It and like looping over the space of all cubic surfaces. Pardon? Are are you are is this um are you so are you taking the variety of all lines on cubic surfaces so on, on one fixed uh, on, one, on fixed. one fixed cubic sur okay. surface? Yes. And so they they obtain some Result. So actually, actually, they don't even uh, need smoothness. So they can compute the etal Euler characteristic of um, any cubic of, of, of uh, this final variety of lines for any cubic surface. And then they also somehow uh, deduce all these classical uh, results like, like you did. And I think it, it could be quite interesting for you, maybe. I mean, so it, it seemed quite similar. The, the, the final variety of lines on the cubic surface would just be well, well, uh, 27 points. Pardon? It's a, it's a field extension of the 27 points over the base field. Ah, uh, uh, yes, yes, so yes. It's like, it's like the discriminant of, if you, if you spread it out over the, the moduli space, you, you, you'd, for, for, every, uh, for every point of the moduli space, you'd be looking at the field extension where all of the lines were defined. Yes. Can you repeat yes, the yes. name this was one more time? Uh, this, this should be uh, Schinder and Galkin. Two fifty. I can also just post you the link in the chat. That's maybe oh, okay. there. I have a comment about that. There's yes. a work of. Um, uh, I was going to say that too. David I know what Byer you're going to say. Sarah, did you know you know about that? Yes, I did. But oh, you you you, you can you. say this. I wasn't sure. I didn't think. I didn't know you knew about it. Go ahead. You tell. And then, oh, I um, uh, I. Mark, thank you, Mark. Um, so uh, uh, Ava Bayer, Flukiger, and, and Sarah can compute the discriminant of that, the space of the lines over the moduli space, and actually get um, the, uh, express the, the quadratic form um, that's the, the discriminant of that generically atoll extension. And, and they can do this um, uh, looking at the, the vial group of E6 and things that that, that, that this says about um, the form. And that actually, it says something different. It gives a quadratic enrichment um, uh, of um, a count of lines with this sort of sums of trace forms. And then uh, it does vary with the cubic surface you have. It depends on the Euler characteristic. And so we could plug in to their result, the Euler characteristic that we computed with Macaulay 2, for example, at this talk, and then say that the, um, that Euler characteristic has to be the sum over all the lines, not of this weight here, but just of the trace form. And so we don't have invariance of number. It will depend on the cubic surface, but we have a formula for it, thanks to Mark and Raxit and um, uh, Ava Bayer, Flukiger and Sarah, um, which it just gives something different. Um, so if you combine that 
in, in the notes, we didn't get to it. We have this condition on hyperbolic and elliptic lines, a parity condition over a finite field. Um, and uh, you can combine their results to show that the number of elliptic lines over a finite field, it, it's always even. Um, whereas uh, if you do this alone, you just have it if they were all defined over K. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, it, it gives something similar. And, Yes, uh, thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. That's a nice question. Are there any other questions, comments? Uh, this, this might be a bit of a stretch, but can you think of this formula as some, some vague Gauss A type thing where you have balancing out curvature, giving you a constant on the right? I don't know. Um, oh, it is Gauss A. <laughs> No curvature, no curvature. Can you say a little Just, bit more than that? What are you? Or well, I was going off of the hyperbolic versus elliptic, it had like positive or negative curvature, and you had the difference summing up to three all the time, and maybe here in a more arithmetic, sophisticated, arithmetically sophisticated way, it's a similar appearance. But apparently Mark thinks that's right, uh, is that? Or did you just say you can't call it? No, I misunderstood maybe, but I didn't, didn't realize you were talking about the, the local invariance in those terms, but that's an interesting thought. Kirsten, do you have any comments on that? No, I, uh, it's, thanks. Okay. Any other questions? I have one, uh, and I, I, you might have said something about this, and I apologize if I missed it. But uh, you computed the Euler characteristic of the collapsed sur surface, um, and then you had that Marken, classical yeah. one. Um, could you say like how this A one uh, Euler characteristic compares to that classical one more? Could Great. you like how how do those relate to each other? Great. So the rank of the Euler characteristic equals the classical one of the C points. And if we were over R, if we take the signature of the Euler characteristic, I don't think I actually did manage to say this, but um, it, um, a similar thing was that this is related to the degrees because there's sums of local degrees and we had this diagram mm -hmm. for the degrees. So you would have had to take that and extrapolate. But yeah, uh, thank you. Um, but that, that is um, okay. Great. the relationship, thank thanks. Yeah, thanks. So any other questions? Yes. Um, so could you comment a bit more on what the equivalence for um, the oriented child groups kind of looks like? Um, so we had that Gersten or that Ross Schmidt complex. And so we had, um, uh, so cohomology groups. Um, uh, we've got the sum over, um, so if we take X co-dimension N, we're gonna wind up with GW of K of X. And then we're gonna have some boundary um, to co-dimension one greater. And this will hit in K Milner bit negative degrees or the VIT group. And then it's going to get hit. Um, K Milner vit um, one uh, K of X. There's a boundary map here. The boundary map, it's like the boundary map in Milner K theory. So it comes from maps. We've got so K discrete value field R ring of integers, K residue field. And we have a map from K Milner vit one of the function field here. It's gonna specialize onto the function field here. And we need to make a map, the GW or K Milner vit zero of the residue field. We can do this mimicking um, Milner's Boundary boundary map for K Milner vit, and this is in Morel's book. A one 
algebraic topology over a field. Um, it's characterized by um, if we have a bunch of um, if we've got a uniformizer and then a bunch of folks in the in the integers, we can get rid of the uniformizer and reduce all of these into the residue field. Um, uh, so, you know, you put all these together and you get a boundary map. Maybe um, it would be good to see a relationship between something like rational equivalence um, and um, I feel like you can sort of see that by an analogy with maybe K Milner. Um, if anyone else has a more geometric thing that might be helpful to say, please, please take the field. It is a little messy. It's, it's or when I when I explain it, it's a little messy. And it sort of looks like that. I think that's what it is. So maybe I can add a comment on this. I mean, as I, I see it, this oriented tube or tube group, it's kind of, we, we, we do not just need the, the cycle of some piece, but we will need some information of the normal bundle of this piece. And uh, when there are intersection, there, there are normal bundle will have some yeah. condition. That, that's, that, my... that's right. There's, there's a, this was sort of a quick sketch. There's extra, it's a little more complicated. You yes, have to have twists by the normal bundle yeah. and that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, this is just a quick sketch. Um, so the determinant of, um, thanks. Yeah, some other questions? I was a bit curious about the questions you were asking at the end of uh, Pro Professor Morrow's lecture. And in particular, I was wondering if like the understanding of the K theory, uh, of Hermitian K theory, how that plays into like these, finding these uh, arithmetic sort of counts, or is that not really? So the, um, uh, the, the local indices for um, Hermitian K theory um, are, um, uh, they're, um, uh, they, they agree with the local degree as, as a bilinear form. Um, so if we took the K theory, um, Euler class and the Euler number, um, uh, we're just going to get something in K zero, which is Z and we'll just get the, the rank and we'll get the answer over the C points. Um, so the fact that we have um, cohomology theories that have interesting cohomology groups associated to them uh, means that you can you can get counts in in those groups. Yes. So does that does that kind of answer your question? Oh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Good. Okay. Writing Good. it down. <laughs> <laughs> Some other questions, comments? So I have a, uh, a notational question and then a follow up question. Does the C and SLC orientation uh, stand for anything or is it just? That's a good question. Um, I don't know. Anybody? Got me. So next question. Okay. okay. My, my next, yeah, I, I only ask because it's uh, sometimes hard for me to remember the condition. Um, so you talked about how like uh, KO is SLC oriented. Are there, um, are there cohomology theories that are maybe not SLC oriented, but when you pass to like some higher, so like instead of differing by a line bundle squared, 
if you differ by, and you probably know where this question is coming from, yeah, Christian, I know, but I know where that, yeah. if, if you differ by some higher power, are there existing cohomology theories that are oriented in this sense, but not in like a, a, a less restrictive sense? Um, yeah, uh, I, I don't know. Um, I think you can do things with like, um, you know, cobordism for different classical groups, like, um, right, like, uh, what is it, like M. Symplectic, symplectic cobordism is symplectically oriented. Yeah, but he's he's uh, he's asking specifically about this condition. Like right, that, it doesn't. Right, I think the power of the line bundle. I'm not sure about that. That I don't know about. So, so then, uh, like the. But, really but I mean, but note note that um, Mark is pointing out that we have lots of. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, so uh, we can take uh, M of um, B string, M of B, uh, GL. maybe it's just M string, like the, the Tom, the Tom, take universal bundle, universal bundle on um, uh, B strings, Tom, spectrum and um, uh, we would get another uh, orient notion of orientation and like TMF has a string orientation. We've got GL and SL and, you know, spin or it's not quite, we're not allowed to do string going up the Posnikov tower. Um, we can then, as Mark is saying, we can take the the Tom spectrum, the the bordism, which is the the Tom spectrum on the universal bundle of lots of cool, lots of cool groups, and have cool orientations. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so then my my last really naive question would like so, would MGL be GL oriented and MSL be SL oriented, or is that just a yeah, because because the it's also question. actually a map. From MGL, so an orientation oh, right. is also a, this yeah. is uh, yeah. So that that's all very consistent. Thanks. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Nice question. So, any other questions? All right. Well, let me call the workshop to a close. Thanks again for everyone for attending. It's been a lot of fun, and uh, let's thank Kirsten one more time for a lovely pair of lectures. And at the same time, thank Mark for, for all the co-organizers and the PCMI.